Well, thank you all. Really good to have you all here and uh, welcome to this session with Peter Mary. Um, I saw his session in uh, Hungary six years ago. I was chatting to him the other day and I thought it was four years ago, but it was actually the one six years ago um, in the sort of rustic warehouse that we had in downtown Budapest. That was the first ever integral conference. So uh, very good to have you here, Peter. Thank you very much. I'm going to be introducing the session and introducing him. If uh, let me just uh, get his bio up so I can read. Cool. So we are here with Peter Merry. He's the co-founder and chief innovation officer at Ubiquity University and founder of the Center for Human Emergence in Netherlands, CHI, which I know a lot of you have heard about and studied there already, I'm seeing in the chat box. Um, he's worked across and in different sectors and he's author of books on evolutionary leadership, uh, the why work and a PhD dissertation on volition theory, which is what we're here to explore today. Um, and he also has an MSc in Human Ecology and Practice Deep Ecology with John Seed. So, um, rather than read out the full abstract, I was chatting to him the other day and he said, this is just going to be a nice relaxed fireside chat. So imagine you're sitting around the campfire somewhere, you're having a nice little chat with him and he's really going to kind of introduce you to some of his latest conclusions on this transition from yellow up into turquoise, which he calls volition theory. Uh, and at the sort of end of the presentation, we're going to go into some breakout rooms. And then after that, we'll come back for a sort of debrief and some Q&A. So you can always put your questions in the chat box as we're going through. Um, and he will sort of uh, answer any clarification questions throughout the presentation. But if they're more sort of contradictory, challenging, well, let's leave them for the end. And then we'll get into the good conversation after the breakout room. But uh, without further ado, I'm just going to hand you over to Peter. So thank you very much for being here, Peter. Thank you, Chris. And hi, everybody. Yeah, so I will just uh, share my screen here. Uh, yeah, get to that one. Get into play mode. Okay, there we go. Cool. Yeah. So as Chris said, it's a luxury really to, to have 90 minutes and I, and I intend to use it. <laughs> and uh, rather than having to, you know, <clears throat> be on stage and have 15 minutes to summarize the essence of what you're about and having to perform and rush through it. This is going to be a stroll through my mind over the last few years. And I'm just going to take you on that journey, uh, really and um and go through you know my conclusions my insights as we've been going um so uh yeah so sit back relax you know <clears throat> have time for questions at the end i'll will keep a track of the clock because uh, although we've got plenty of time i want to make sure we have some time for some interaction as well but uh yeah a little fireside chat like chris said really a session to philosophize so as with any theory or philosophy, it has implications, like integral theory has implications. I'm not going to go into the implications now or related practices. When I started ar around this, it was really a, a new philosophical argument that, for me, better made sense of the world as I was seeing it and, and experiencing it. So that's what I want to share. So... This was the question that actually came to me recently, or the thought experiment. What if time and space moves through us rather than us moving through time and space? What if time and space moves through us rather than us moving through time and space? So these, this is one of the things that was bugging me at the beginning of my inquiry into evolution, is this rather suspicious fact that humans seem to be at the center of the scale from big to small. So if you look at the universe, down to Planck, and then humans right in the middle. Okay, interesting, but it bugged me. And it was like, hmm. A bit suspicious is that chance, is that how come humans are, seem to be right at the middle of that? That's in turn, that's a kind of spatial thing. 
in terms of time, my feeling and direct experience was that the further we attempt to stretch our branches into the future, to expand our consciousness, the deeper we actually have to send our roots into the past to deal with any trauma or blocked energy that needs to be released in order for us to take that leap forward. So past and future are intrinsically related. Another way to look at it and you'll begin to see soon the torus form shape up that's at the core of evolution. So a, a cycle of time where past and future are continually interacting with each other with the present right at the center. Another question that bugged me was how come ancient civilizations seem to contain wisdom and technology that we're only just coming to understand and realize the power of when in our developmental models, they were meant to be far less, less complex than we are. So tribal purple, you know, was down the chain as it were down the line, less complex. And yet, we're finding all sorts of things out about those civilizations in terms of the actual technology they had that wasn't the kind of technology we have, but that was maybe more information and energy based that enabled them to do things that we still can't do ourselves. So, so what was that all about? That didn't quite fit the developmental model of increasing complexity. So that was bugging me. And then the thing that really tipped it was work I was doing with Dylan Newcomb, who's a dancer, a philosopher as well, a composer, choreographer. And what he did is he took a hundred, hundreds actually of dancers through workshops, um, working with sound and movement to see how different sounds correlated to different movements. And he ended up with eight sounds that seem to the dancers whenever they made that sound they all seem to make a similar movement and so he was okay so there seems to be a movement related to sound and he was also into integral and he got this thought one day that mm, maybe those eight sound movement dynamics are related to the uh, value systems so we teamed up and we did an experiment with these dancers and what came out of it <clears throat> was very interesting. So he tied this into the I, the I Ching, and these are kind of representations of uh, uh, three yin yang systems. So if it's pure white, it's actually three yin, pure black, three yang. And those basic dynamics reflected the energy systems, the movement sequences that the dancers felt best fitted with those value systems. And what you actually saw was that once you got to blue, the movement dynamics started to mirror back up. So if you'll notice that really the, from orange up, that's a mirror of the systems that are below. So, the difference was that it was the same core movement and archetype, but it was more subtle as you went up the spiral. So you got this mirroring of the core archetypal movements, but you got a more subtle reflection. So orange was a more subtle reflection of blue. Green was a more subtle reflection of red. Yellow was a more subtle reflection of purple and turquoise was a more subtle reflection of beige. So that reinforced something for me about there being not a unidirectional process at play here, but something kind of expanding out from a center. Just a kind of sidebar here, what they also discovered as they played with the chakra energies is that those seem to sit in between the value systems, that they were actually transformational dynamics that enabled you to move from one stage to another stage. 
And then of course, right at the center of it, you've got the heart chakra. And it's interesting to note that the very first organ that's created in the womb is the heart. And everything else grows out from the heart. It doesn't start at chakra one, as it were, or chakra eight. Some starts at the heart. So you began, we began to explore these kind of relationships. Now that is what kind of pushed me, tipped me over the edge, as it were, into this inquiry that led to uh, volution. And the sense I was getting was that really what was going on is that you are that there was a tension field being created between let's to use spiral language let's say beige and turquoise that that was a field that was being held between kind of the gross material as it were and the potentiated and that somehow that tension field was creating a dynamic that was moving in and out uh, like this and then I came across Buckminster Fuller and others related work and this term of tensional integrity or tensegrity. So the tension manifests the form and the form holds the tension. The tension manifests the form and the form holds the tension. So I was seeing a potential pattern behind this spiral octave and we chose to work explicitly with the octave. We can go into that later if people want to know why. Um, and that with beige as an example of what I call the seed and turquoise as the example of what I call uh, the potential. So this basic idea of, hmm, there seems to be this kind of process going on here. And I'd had an intuition for a while that it was actually all about a torus process and a torus dynamic, toroidal geometry. Um, and so that's what I started to dig into. And in fact, started to also explore the idea that maybe it's a double torus dynamic, which is something that those of you who know Nassim Haramain's work, um, that he has also uh, explored. So there was something there's something going on here and what's the way to explain what's actually happening as an underlying dynamic of how things manifest with spiral as an example of that. Because what the dancers found is if you look at the, the circles that are up there, the I Ching circles, that you had kind of a more unity dynamic so that pure white pure white and pure black pure yin and pure yang and that as you move towards the center they become more uh, distinct so differentiated you get a differentiation and a unification unification if you think about beige is precognitive unity experience turquoise is post-cognitive unity experience right and when you get down into the orange and the blue, you're really into structures, strategies, into the granularity of something, right? As opposed to the unity of it. So we were getting this kind of unity at the extremes into increasing granularity and manifestation at the center. So <clears throat> this is just a note to say, I'm not attempting or going to attempt to talk about oneness because you can't, right? <laughs> words are inadequate. So the void, the words are spoken to explain the void, the void as such can never be expressed. Though we say the mind is a bright light, it is actually beyond all words and symbols. Although the mind is void in essence, all things it embraces and contains. So you can't philosophize about the void. So this is not what this is about, this is about What's the dynamic of manifestation in the relative world? How does stuff come into being? How does stuff come into life in our relative reality with an understanding that there is also the void, but that you can't really say anything about it? The next step down, as it were, from the void 
is what is called the unified field. So this is a field that doesn't do anything. It's static. It's, it's, it's got a structure in it with a number of polarities and things in it that's holding it in place. It's a unified field. And something happens to that unified field to pull it into movement. A tension is created that pulls that unified field into a dynamic that is actually what uh, manifests life in, as we know it. So, and it looks something like this. You'll see this image coming back. So this is, of course, a 2D image, um, and I'm going to invite you to look at it in a way like this 3D image. And that the core of this process that I, I want to describe now, which was my thesis, as it were, my argument, is that all of life emerges out of a creative tension between seed and potential, or between present moment and possibility. Okay. And they, what happens is that they actually grow into each other. So the potential is a field of information and possibility. The seed is a packed, dense uh, matter. And those two, what creates life is the growing into each other of the dense material seed and the potential uh, energy information field. And that creates a surface in that tension field between seed and potential, what's called, could be called a brain or a membrane. So when you take that <clears throat> to the torus, seed, potential, brain, membrane, and the membrane or the brain surface holds the highest potential information of what this entity could become. So you've got potential and you've got seed and right at the center, you've got the heart chakra, the heart of the entity. And it's that process, that field of tension that actually ends up creating the manifestation of the material relative world as we know it and can see it, interestingly, at a 90 degree plane. So there are three <clears throat> key dynamics or key elements to this process that <clears throat> I saw going on and that I'll show you in a minute reflected the key wisdom traditions. I tried to create kind of neutral terms for them, as it were. At one level, you've got the container, the possibility, the container, the brain. At another level, You've got the manifest reality. So manifest reality, possibility, and you've got the dynamics, everything that goes on in between the tension field between the manifest and the container, the current and the possible. Okay. So three things you can look at. You look at the way things are now. You can look at the, the container, the potential, and you can look at the dynamics between the two. So you can have other words for the container, sacred father, black Madonna, the absolute, the one, the unified field. Sacred mother holds everything. Manifestation is the many, the one on the one hand, the many on the other, the Christ, Mary, different first level of differentiation. And then you've got the dynamics, which are known as spirit or Shekinah or subtle energies. And all of that, if you read the Volution dissertation, there's a whole table where I've looked at all various different traditions and how they, have, they all describe this trinity. This is the trinity, essentially. Yeah. And what they're describing, in my opinion, is the fundamental dynamic of creation, of how life comes into being. And I think you can also think of the container 
as the soul because it's what holds the information about everything that that entity could potentially become. But you can't see it because it's like a fish in water. You're like, when you are the entity, you can't, the soul is, transcends everything. So like the fish in water, you can't ever get beyond it, but it contains the highest potential of that entity. And in a, in a kind of more scientific way, you could say it contains all the information in the field that could be manifested as that entity. When you look at a torus, what's interesting is that the field, uh, the boundary and the outside actually goes right into the center as well. So the same, it's not just a sits out there, but it connects right in. So when they talk about a black hole, this is the dynamic, you get information comes in, goes out through the black hole at the center. And that information is carried out into the container on the outside of the torus. Note the galaxy <clears throat> manifested at a 90 degree plane. And there are various cosmic images you know, around that actually depict this, uh, this dynamic at work. So then I came across um, Buckminster Fuller's work. This is the jitterbug. And what the jitterbug actually describes is the process, again, of something coming into form, but it's a, ge it's a geometry. And I got this from Marshall Lefferts in his wonderful work on cosmometry. And what's actually going on is that life is kind of moving out from the center and in, uh, out to the field, information fields, bringing that information back into manifestation, manifestations connecting back out to the information fields. And it's a constant breathing process. So many of the traditions have talked about life of the cosmos as a big breath, right? And as you go through this process of, uh, of the jitterbug, um, you're actually going through many different um, forms, different geometric forms, the key um, platonic solids. So at each different level, you en encounter a different platonic solids and the platonic solids are the building blocks of, of material life, as we know. So this process is literally the geometry or the dynamic of the torus, you know, kind of breathing in and out as information and energy is communicated throughout the system in a fractal holographic way, which we'll come to, so that information permeates the whole system as it informs, literally informs the material manifestation. And in that process, for those of you who are into the geometry, um, you see that the relationships between the parts uh, as things come into form are based on the sacred geometry, geometric uh, relationships, such as phi and the Fibonacci process. So, a kind of sub-chapter, but an interesting one to explore is this question of holograms, because the kind of one of the subtitle of the thesis was about it being a holographic uh, universe, a holographic reality. So how might that work? So most of you will know what holograms are, right? So when you have a hologram, if you cut up the picture of the hologram, you still get in each of the pieces of the picture, you still get the whole image, right? So the thing about a hologram is that the whole image is present in every single part, right? So the way a hologram actually works is pure light, a single laser beam, gets split, differentiated. And one of the beams is sent to the object that you're trying to create the image of on the holographic plate. And the other beam is mirrored round to meet that beam that once it has passed by the actual object. So in this case, the beam goes, the, the laser beam is split. One uh, part goes 
to the apple, the other part is directed back via the mirror onto the holographic plate, and that's where they meet to create this holographic image. Okay, that's how the, the hologram works. So, what if the skin of the torus, the boundary of the entity, was actually a holographic plate through which universal light consciousness passes and it's that that creates the 3D form that manifests at the 90 degree plane. So as we know from you know, at last science and quantum science catching up with the wisdom traditions, it's awareness of something that co-creates it. So if that awareness is consciousness and consciousness is light and information is captured, is held on a holographic plate in that sense, then the boundary would be the hologram. And as an entity grows, that information the, on that holographic boundary differentiates increasingly. And that enables the form at the manifest level to become more refined uh, in its growth. There's a question from Raquel that's come in a couple of times. Why 90 degrees and not 360? <laughs> that's a good question, Raquel. And I don't know why 90 degrees. There's probably some esoteric reason why it seems to click in at 90 degrees once it moves into our visible the visible realm but i've come across it from a number of sources and that just seems to be i think your tip you're moving from let's say the subtle into the gross and it's that subtle into gross that somehow comes out at a 90 degree plane and i don't know why maybe somebody maybe somebody can tell us later <laughs> so imagine you've got that you've got this form with its boundary field this torus that as awareness or consciousness comes through or light comes through that boundary it diff that's the, the the form starts to differentiate itself into our material reality so archetypals archetypes would exist in the space between the boundary and the manifest reality right? like the I Ching, you know, differentiating out from yin yang to yin yang, yin yang, to yin yang, yin yang, yin yang. So it just becomes increasingly differentiated as one goes through. And um, Jude Curvin, who was my major advisor for the, for the PhD thesis, was saying, well, the general directionality of life is increasing interconnectedness and increasing differentiation at the same time. And if you think about it, it makes sense because as things get more differentiated, you have more parts, each piece is released to be its unique self. As Ken says, you know, release something by limiting it, by really identifying what its role is in the whole. And the more parts you get, the more relationships you get. Right? More parts, more relationships. More material, more field. So at the same time, you're getting greater differentiation and greater interconnectedness. So when people talk about a holographic universe and you see patterns showing up everywhere, and there's a brilliant book called Scale by Jeffrey, and I've forgotten his second name, but it basically shows how if you look at the growth of cities, if you look at internet traffic, if you look at library book loans, whatever, all these things that we would expect to be random, you actually see a pattern and an algorithm under them. So nothing is completely random. There seem to be these patterns permeating uh, everything. And so global scaling, in a way, is, is how patterns show up at all different levels uh, of reality. And this is kind of freaky. If you relax your eyes, you'll start see these things starting to move. But holographic information field, as they overlap, there, is, there are holes through which light can pass, space through which light can pass that enables it to project a 3D form. And what people who do energetic work, be it at the individuals or at collective levels, know is that 
these openings through which light can come can be contracted, blocked, or polluted. And actually what a healer is doing is, is unblocking or unclearing, uh, clearing up these spaces so that the light can permeate through and the information that the system needs is actually accessible to it because then it can look after itself. Okay, enough on holograms. Think of that idea of the boundary of the torus of an entity having that holographic pattern of it, light coming through. That's what um, takes the pattern through into the manifest form and why these patterns are reflected at every different level in a fractal way. So when we come back to, let's say, a linear story, because um, what does that mean for the way we see things grow in the linear uh, dimension? Um, this is what kind of crystallized out for me. So we have this process seed potential in this tension field, and that's what's bringing things into manifestation. You have the seed. In the first phase, energy is built up within the boundary of the seed as it feels the pull from the potential. At some point, the energy breaks through the boundary of the seed, as you would see the little initial sprouts break through the boundary of a plant seed and is on its doing its expansion. And remember what it's doing is it's becoming less dense the whole time. Right? A seed is an extremely dense piece of matter. And then as information permeates the, uh, that density, the density expands, right? differentiates right? As, it, as it grows. The moment that the energy breaks through at that point, it's able to differentiate between me and other. So if we go back to spiral, then from beige purple, me and other is one. Right? The child when they're two until they're three, can't differentiate between themselves and the mother it's one and then with red is the first emergence of the ego that differentiates between self and other okay and when you get to blue of course there's a big differentiation because what you're doing is you're creating the hierarchy of whose place is where in the system so that's the expression of this deeper dynamic is what i'm suggesting so you're beginning to see the information permeate into the material, the potential permeate into the seed. So in the next phase, the energy continues to expand from its initial push, but is now able to look back and reflect upon itself. That's a really critical moment for the entity, right? Is able to see itself, become conscious of itself. And in the final stage, things slow down, integrate, and encapsulate everything from the past. So if you think about how yellow and turquoise are described, I mean, you'll notice the slowing down already as we get to green, right? People tend to pull back from the craziness of orange, slow down, go inside, breathe, work on themselves. And then what yellow tries to do, its core energy is to connect up all the pieces. So we know the difference between first tier, second tier and Graves' model is that each of the first tier systems believe they're the only right one. And the thing that led to the exponential growth in problem solving capacity at second tier was the, was the fact that you weren't caught up in your own value system, but you were able to see the, the role that they could all play and therefore integrate them all to create the solutions that were needed. And then turquoise, of course, gets to this more intuitive sense of the system as a whole. Okay, so this being an underlying pattern that ref again reflected in the spiral model. And here you've got the system locked in, as it were. You've got its, its full potential in its current manifestation is permeated into the, um, into the material as a whole. So the soul, if we take that boundary, the information field, in a way it's, it's completed its journey from seed to fruit. It's now fully integrated its potential and is, is, is literally kind of heaven on earth in that sense, has completely um, fulfilled its soul's journey, you could say. 
other people have you know described this in in different ways um just different words for the same thing really the original participation the separation and distinction and then the reintegration okay so beige to purple original participation no distinction all is one in a pre-cognitive way red through to green in the sense of differentiation even green is in differentiation because it's each person has their own truth it's the ultimate differentiation but is leaning into how they're all meant to be treated equally this okay, so is leaning towards the integ reintegration that comes at yellow and turquoise so what happens in those in the first half of this journey is that there pre-exists a field of information for how things are meant to be, how things have been laid down before in the information fields. Okay? And in the first part of the journey, we're just following the path that's already been laid down. So you could say in spiral from beige to blue, it's really just following the system without really thinking about it too much before, without much self reflection so the for those who are familiar with Rupert Sheldrake's work the morphogenetic field the information field that um, when you've got the seed and the potential that was growing into the seed basically we're just following that that field that pattern in the field the cosmic groove as Ken would say what happens in the next stage is that that entity is embarking on its own mission into the unknown to try to fulfill its unique purpose and it's at that point that it becomes self-reflective, right? Needs to turn around and look back at its pathway so far and integrate each of those parts. So from a spiral perspective, you could say orange needs to integrate blue. Green then has to integrate red, which is the whole mean green meme journey that goes on, the struggle that green has between, you know, do you allow each person their own truth? But what if that truth is fundamentally uh, exclusive to others? What do you do with that? Can, can, you know, how do you deal with this postmodern relativism? Um, and then yellow has to integrate purple, which is why you see as people get into integral, they often end up getting into shamanism and things as well. Although people often don't talk about that in integral circles because they're afraid people will think they're being um, romantic and regressing to an earlier system that's less complex. Right. And then turquoise has to integrate beige. Why? Because anybody who works with energy will know it's the body that translates the energy. So you get your messages if you're dowsing, it's nothing to do with the crystal at the end of your dowsing thing. It's to do with the body passing on information through micro movements. So energy, as soon as you get into the world of energy, you have to get back into your body. So turquoise has to integrate beige. So that's that second half of the journey, as it were. And it, essentially, it's a relationship between freedom and integration. So as you're ex trying to expand and uh, increase your freedom, you're going to ha you have to do your integration work with the past, which is the shadow work, the cleanup, right? In order to grow up, you've got to clean up. So you've got this impulse to grow. Next step, that impulse, when you do that, what you're doing is you're bringing in more light, more consciousness, you're reaching up, opening the portal, as it were, more. That light shows more shadow. Light creates shadow, light, light illumines shadow. So your shadow is lit up, you go, okay, now I'm gonna go for this and in the next stage of my development, and life goes, yeah, dude, and you have gotta clear this up first because that's holding the energy back for you to take the next step. Once you transform that blockage into energy, that's released and that enables the growth. Yeah. So that's this continual movement from the, from the center, as it were, out and how past and future are so intrinsically related. Yeah, and it's light and it's love. Love is really what enables you and compassion is what enables you to integrate the stuff that you're struggling with. Light expands, love connects until the whole thing is 
integrated. And that seed has become a fruit and creates a cocoon that turns its in itself into a seed for something completely new to emerge. And the whole thing starts all over again. <laughs> so that journey from seed to fruit, boom, fruit becomes seed for the next. Okay. And of course, this symbol, Star David symbol, in so many traditions is a symbol of transformation as the information doesn't, isn't just whole with the material and possibility, but actually permeates it, pushes through the boundary, which then expands it up, you see, to a next level where the journey starts again of integration. So we're in this journey, this is the slide I showed before, of tensional integrity, of this breathing in this tension, cre constantly creating this dynamic. It happens at every level of every system in terms of holarchies, as Ken has described, same dynamic, it's fractal, holographic. Here's an example as people des would describe it for plants. Right, so you've got the, you've got the seed, you've got the, the, the energy field. If you've ever done work with, with plants, you can actually feel, it's beautiful, beautiful feeling. You can feel the, this kind of sun, golden sun above the, the plant, which is its, its, its soul in a way, its information field. And what's happening is that they're growing into each other. Now, what are the implications of this? If I was just to look at one core implication um, for where we are, where we are now uh, on this planet as humanity. So my sense is, and this is backed up by what Ken wrote in Up From Eden, is that when we, and we particularly in the West, made the step from purple to red, rather than transcending and including, we transcended and repressed. Right? So as we differentiated from this precognitive experience of unity, where we were the earth, it was just in the way kind of, you know, we could experience all the different energies and dynamics around us. For some reason, and why that might be, it can just be circumstance of the certain forms that came in at that time. Um, the very, you know, from the red blue systems with the religions that were then translated from their high inspiration into the cultural form. That's the reason why we burned the witches because we were too scared in that push into uh, our individuation, let's say from purple into red, the idea of um, falling back into that unity system, as it were, for some, at whatever level was too scary for us and we wanted to be the ones in control. So what we did at that point is that we split ourselves off basically at the neck from our body, from the earth, and from the feminine, essentially. And then we carried on our journey up the spiral, but because we weren't held in the container of purple and beige, which is the body and the deep sense of belonging and the deep sense of safety that that gives you, then we went on a wild hunt that has been completely, literally unrooted. Where we've been through these value systems, but in such a way that it's actually enabled us to destroy the very container that holds us. I mean, when we realize, you know, when I talk to groups now and I say, just remember, we are the earth. You know, this is the earth talking to itself right now. You're the earth listening to itself. That shouldn't be such a strange idea. <laughs> but it is. And that's crazy. 
And that, that points to the problem. The problem is that we cut ourselves off. We transcended and repressed. And that's created enormous pain, uh, enormous fear in us. And that's what's enabled us to destroy the planet. Because otherwise, how on earth could we have justified that to ourselves when we remembered that actually we are this earth? <laughs> then there's no way we could have gone on that trip. And the thing is that un until we heal that split and we reintegrate our relationship to those precognitive yin systems, then we're not going to get access to the post-cognitive yin systems of interconnectedness that will enable us to heal ourselves and the world, that yellow and turquoise. So think of it as when you look at the dancer's <clears throat> image, beige, purple are yin-based. Their essence is about the starting point is interconnectedness, not consciously, just experientially. The central four systems are yang based because they're all about differentiation, which isn't a bad thing if you transcend and include rather than transcend and repress. When you get up to yellow turquoise, you're back into a interconnectedness as being the foundational perspective, but then a transcognitive perspective of interconnectedness. But we don't get that gift until we have gone back and done our work to integrate the body, the feminine uh, sense of who we are as the earth. That's what will enable us to access the intelligence and wisdom that we need to solve the challenges that we're in. So I love this quote from David Abraham. It says, and this ties it kind of together in terms of what are we talking about here in terms of evolution, right? When I say beyond linear developmental thinking. The conceptual separation of time and space, the literate distinction between linear progressive time and homogeneous featureless space functions to eclipse the enveloping earth from human awareness, blinds us to purple turquoise. As long as we structure our lives according to assumed parameters of a static space and a rectilinear time, we will be able to ignore or overlook our thorough dependence upon the earth around us. Only when space and time are reconciled into a single unified field of phenomena does the encompassing earth become evident once again in all its power and its depth, as the very ground and horizon of all our knowing. So my sense is what evolution theory offers is a way for us to understand and think about ourselves and life that reintegrates time and space, not in a linear sense, but in an organic sense that creates space for the rest of reality and will ultimately enable us to heal ourselves and the world around us. So what if time and space moves through us rather than us moving through time and space? That's it. Wonderful. Thank you, Peter. Some great comments and questions coming in on the chat, but I know you wanted to do a breakout uh, room to get these guys discussing some of this. Um, do you still want to do that for 15 minutes? It's uh, 10 to the hour. We've got, we've got 40 minutes, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, take, let's take 10 minutes, shall we? 10 minutes. Cool. Everyone back. We'll just wait for everyone to join again. And Peter's going to uh, answer a couple of questions that are in the chat box that he was reading through while you're in your breakout groups. Um, so we're going to go into that first. And then uh, Snazjana wanted to uh, 
ask something and comment on something after that. And then we're going to open it up generally for some Q&A and reflections. But uh, Peter, I'm intrigued by your answer to those questions in the chat box myself. So uh, let us know. Yeah, I just pick up on a couple of them. Um, one was, um, I think Raquel asked, where did the word volution come from? Well, <clears throat> honestly, I was sitting here one day as I was in taking my morning to work on my PhD. And um, I was like, okay, you've got evolution and then you've got involution. And they're both described as linear processes. But I don't think that they are two different processes. I think they're one process. And so I was like, well, what do evolution and involution have in common? And it was just like kind of a moment of insight. And it was, oh, yeah, volution, of course. If you take off the in and you take off the air, you're left with the core, which is volution. And I was like, I wonder what that means. So I looked it up and it means spin. And everything spins, right? Cells spin, the earth spins, cosmos spins. So uh, a torus spins. So I was, oh, well, there we go. That's why we'll call it volution then. So that's where that came from. And then the other thing I just comment on um, before we open it up is this question of, oh, so does this mean that life stops at turquoise? <laughs> well, there are theories of things beyond turquoise, but I've really yet to meet anybody who's actually embodied anything beyond turquoise. So, that's why Dylan and I in the research chose to work with the octave up to turquoise because that seemed to be the space that any of us could talk with any actually experiential uh, insight about. People who go on about stuff beyond turquoise, it tends to be an orange actually, because orange is the one that's wanting to know what's next, how can I get higher and higher, and everything else. So um, yeah, we can theorize about it. But we, I consciously chose to work with the octave for a number of reasons, right? Obviously, octave, when you hit the, musically, you hit the eighth note on the octave, it completes something. Um, so sure, you could probably, you know, you could come up with a philosophy if you chose to go Graves' route and do six and then another six and then another six, which is apparently what he described. My sense is that something quite significant will emerge beyond turquoise that we can't actually see or describe with our current perspective. And when I was in the SDI trainings with Don Beck and he was describing everything, and I think Raquel, you might've been there actually. And I said to Don, um, so Don, it seems to me that spiral dynamics is a yellow model. It's a model that's come out of yellow, right? Given the way you're describing it. And he was, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was kind of, okay. So, um, so that means that when we get to turquoise, spiral dynamics will be inadequate to describe our reality. He paused for a minute and then in his Texan drawl, which I can't imitate, he said, I like the way you think, Mary. And that was where he left it. So, but if you think about it, the model itself predicts its inadequacy. Developmental models predict their own inadequacy beyond a certain point, which is the, the value system out of which they emerged. Beyond that, there'll be some other way of understanding and experiencing reality. So, So I'll leave it at that for now and then, uh, but I did love somebody's comment. We put the goddess into exile completely. That's what we did. And that's at the core, in my perspective, that's at the core of our current challenges. Great, okay. Well, let's open it up for comments and any questions on everything you've heard so far. And Snesnyana wanted to go first. Let me unmute you. And I've uh, allowed everyone to unmute themselves now. So after Snesnyana goes, please just uh, unmute yourself and jump in if you've got any comments or questions. Let's try and get her unmuted first. Yes. Chris, can you have the speakers show up? rather than me pinned now, is that possible or? Is that yeah, possible? sorry, I thought I'd unpinned you. Let me unpin Maybe you have, I don't you. know. No, I hadn't, I've forgotten. <laughs> there we go. Excellent, Snesiana, you're on, you're unmuted. Thank you. How many seconds I have to explain? Let's, what... let's huh? try and keep it to a minute, two minutes max, each person just to give everyone a chance. Let's say stop Snesiana, okay. Uh, I'm working with people for 40 years, maybe more. So the main question to me, how from the seed to come to the fruit? 
humanistic psycho psychology and psychotherapies are just promises that we are the nice seed and we shall be a nice fruit. However, the uh, situation uh, has to be changed. And uh, Freud was more pessimistic and there is no chance to be a nice fruit. And I will not go into details uh, theoretically. So I can say about my work, uh, it's uh, very important to be included, to be integral, to work uh, uh, on uh, certain levels and to work on the level of body, of mind and on spirit. So uh, to, be, to become a good fruit, you start from the body, of course. But uh, first uh, to be uh, uh, in communication with the client, you start cognitively to talk about and to understand each other and to make uh, trust and to, to see what we are going to do. So after that, we are going deeply emotionally after cognitive uh, just the uh, first, uh, first part, we are going uh, emotionally to the, uh, to the um, uh, place where everything happened. Uh, we are trying to find the killer. Where is the killer? Who was uh, that uh, somebody? Uh, and also we are going transper transgenerationally to see what we have permission and uh, just uh, um, injunctions and blah blah blah. So when you come, when we come to that spot emotionally, and we go deeply to the body, we just uh, come to the place where we open our mind, where where we just not in a, a zone of uncomfort and safety, and we just uh, look a little bit more uh, uh, ahead. So that's the point when we are just one leg uh, in the air and the um, other leg is on the ground. So we need a, a, a psychotherapist as a third parent just to be able to overcome that gap. So after that, when we clean our garden from the deed, we are able to put a nice seed and to have a nice plant. And we are just uh, now in a position to decide about our life and what the future will be. We are just a masterpiece of uh, our life. And uh, we have do a lot of mindful work and uh, uh, it's important to know that there is some, some line between uh, what is a seed and what is a nice fruit we are coming to become. So that's the end of my story and I have a very good uh, result. And uh, the first sign that I'm good in what I'm doing is that my uh, clients, that my educants are starting to be better. Uh, just change uh, even a physical uh, appearance. Can you imagine that I can show you the photos to see? Such a beauty you can't imagine that exists. So I'm very proud. Thank you. Just uh, doing my integral um, center to just spread to all over the world. So I'm happy to be in a family with people who believe in a better world. So thank you, Peter. Thank you, you, you. I have no idea what's your name, but I can't read it <laughs> some there. I am Please. not good in the names, but thank you both of you. Excellent. Is thank it, you. It's two minutes right. or more. No, that's it. We'll have to move on. We need to uh, go into some questions as well. So thank you very okay. much for that. Thank you. Thank Thanks, Nijana. Yeah, I resonate with that. Right, um, we have Alejo and I know Malk has a question as well. They both have their hand up. Alejo, what do you have for us? You can unmute yourself. You should be able to now. No. Hello again, go. everybody. Hello, nice to meet you again. Uh, Peter, uh, it, it, it's a question that uh, I raised the other day to Peter Spider uh, uh, last Monday because uh, or the, the oneness, or the uniqueness, the, or, or, or God, or, or the it, or, or, or the awareness, or that the, the, the un unnameable is it's, it's perfect. It's essentially perfect perfection. Then it expresses itself out through polarity. 
okay, then things. But, but what's the impulse for for per patient to express it says, as itself mm -hmm. out? Why, yeah. why why does it need to know itself if if it doesn't need to doesn't need anything? Yeah, yeah, great question, Alejo. Yeah, yeah. The way I make sense of that is that <clears throat> if you think ecologically, it's like so. What creates the tension, right? Yeah, it's like a niche. What, what, a what niche. for? What for? Yeah, the way I understand it is for creating it. If things are moving in this general directionality of increasing differentiation, increasing interconnectedness, right, if that's the general directionality, that in that process, um, niches emerge in the ecology. Do you know what I mean? It's like from an, in an ecological system, no, be a niche, no, no, which is a, a gap, a vacuum, a gap where something, a need needs to be filled. Okay. okay? And that, that, that need between something yeah. that is now and needs to be yeah. creates the tension field that pulls on the unified field that gets the whole thing going. Oh, so it's a response uh, to it. But, but where is the, the other force? Which force? If there's the uniqueness, there's uniqueness, what is the other force to, to create a tension? The tension, is, as I understand it, is between a system that is um, trying to volute or evolve and it towards greater interconnectedness and greater differentiation. And in that what, process, what, what? needs something to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know, no, no. But, but I go before, be, beforehand, before yeah. that. What's the impulse for uniqueness to uh, evolve or evolve? What's the need for it? What's the impulse oh, for perfection to, to evolve? I mean, why is life moving towards greater interconnectedness and greater differentiation? Is that your question? Why? Yeah, uh, move to whatever. Yeah. Why? Uh, yeah. Why, why, why does perfection need to express it out? Oh, to be able, well. Through, through imperfection, evidently. If you go back to some evidently. of the, you know, uh, traditional religions, it's so it can see itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's the thing. But why, why does it need to, to see itself? <laughs> And no answer to that. It's already there. That, that's the thing. So Rupert said me the other day uh, something like we were talking about this. He, he, he said me uh, uh, because uh, why not? Yeah, it's why just not? a matter of freedom. Yeah. I don't think I have an. I don't have an answer <laughs> to that. You know why? Does... <laughs> Alejo, Peter, if I may, I yeah. it comes to, if, if it comes to my mind the game of the lila the lila's game which is the original game from existence so the tension and the seed is created precisely to just have a ball to play to to start a experience which will be joyful and let's have a ball <laughs> you universe <laughs> you know it's that it will be <laughs> certainly is in you anyway <laughs> <laughs> beautiful thank you let's get him out max had his hand up for a while welcome out good to see you here been a while hello chris and hello peter hi 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 um can you elaborate a little bit on um how in these times um the individual kind of opening or transformational uh things that are going on in people translate to a collective kind of uh, breakthrough or breaking open or um so we are at an at a moment of breaking open at this moment so what what what's going on there from your perspective when all survival strategies do not work anymore mm. and uh, well, we are at the um, from the it's hard to give you two perspectives. One is the kind of perspective I would have described in evolutionary leadership, so the evolutionary perspective that we're basically in a a non-linear leap moment where uh, where where the system is looking to express itself at a a level an emergent level that'll have emergent properties beyond where we are now. And what happens in those mo in those times is you get a breakdown of the old systems and you get a, a, a breakthrough of the new. 
and you can never predict exactly when that breakthrough is going to happen. That's the tipping point, right? And it's uh, so it happens in us, it happens around us, you know, it happens fractally throughout the system. Um, from a evolutionary perspective, I'd say that, you know, we're pushing into collectively now into trying to out of the yang central four into the next into the into the healing or holding of the seed into the fruit as it were and to do that we have to go back and clean up stuff and it's like when you clean up a wound and you pierce it and all the pus comes out it's just in our situation you know donald trump comes out you know so <laughs> so it's like you know we're trying to we're having to go we're having to deal with stuff that we repressed in the past and in my experience it's that deep uh, sense of, of interconnectedness as the earth that we push that away and we're having to like really come to our senses literally um, in that process and that's uh, and that's a messy process as you know anybody knows with exposing and dealing with shadow and individually and collectively um, so I expect there to be a lot more um, struggle and suffering and pain you know as we move forward um, but can we hold that as part of the light shining more light as it were shining on more shadow yeah and then how do we what is that what is that telling us about what we need to learn and integrate in ourselves to be able to get the energy to take the next step both yeah. individually and collectively that's how I see it yeah. And, and that somebody said there was a, one question somewhere around, uh, um, uh, will, you know, us, us existing or something, you know, will we make it? Um, is there a guarantee that every system does complete its journey successfully from seed to fruit? No, 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 it may, if it doesn't succeed in integrating the stuff, then it, then it's not a good fit mm. you know, for the next stage. So it just disappears. Yeah. Uh, can we guarantee that humanity will survive? No. 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 If not, Earth will go on another journey to see if it can, uh, you know, see itself in another way. Yes. So uh, Ken calls this, maybe it's a photo finish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yep. It'll well, be like between us and, us and the viruses, right? Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm, great Thank question, you. Mark. Thank you. Uh, Santiago, you've had your hand up a while. You're unmuted. Do you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, well, whoa, uh, like right now, my, my, my brain is like on fire right now. It's just, it's just, and I, I'm so grateful for this presentation. We, I'm, I was just thinking about like, what's the potential when you come, okay, like we start from the seed and the seed at the same time comes from like our starting point comes from uh, the collective field. So we have like all this conditioning where we start from and there's one moment we will start we start transcending all that and carrying our own personal journey towards uh, transcendence and integrating and reprogramming and just bringing all this in inspiration to the world and not just us acting through conditioning and the moment where we get to turkey so we get to uh, like a whole fruit and we're there like this is just like just thinking for fun just we get there, we think about, okay, we have no idea what can come next. What are the next levels of development? But if we think that if we start from the context of the field that's in the present moment from what's coming from the past, and we think, okay, like where can we be in the future context? And we see the exponential evolution of technology where it's taking us. Like the potential for humanity is just amazing. It's fascinating if we think like, when AI comes, you know, we have our brains just connected to a conscious net, to a network with full of information. And all that is working, it's already happening, you know, like enhanced reality through virtual reality, through augmented reality, where it's just like directly into our eyes, into our experience. And we go like intergalactic um, humans just getting outside into space. And all that is starting right now. But in the moment that humanity has evolved to a point where the collective is somewhere in integral and the turquoise, where is the context going to be in terms of material evolution? And what can emerge afterwards is gonna be related to that context. And, the, and it's just like, if you see the tendencies of material evolution 
and the leading edge of human evolution and you put it together like we have no freaking idea what can come next like it's something completely new it's something that it, it can be grasped from the present moment because it should be in a context where where just human and experiential potential it's amazing and i don't know i just wanted to share that and have your thoughts about about that and mm. where can all this lead to mm, thanks yeah well it's a it's an interesting one this question of of exponential technology technological development because you know as if you're familiar with ken's work you know he talks about the different lines of development mm -hmm. so if we get a misfit between advanced technology and wounded morality then we have a problem yeah so if if the power of technology rapidly increases but we're not able to go back and clear up our traumas and be able to use that technology in a mature way for the good of the whole. And that ends up in the hands of wounded, egocentric humans. Uh, then that's going to increase our probability of, uh, of disappearing. <laughs> so the potential is indeed there. Um, but there is often an over romanticization of the technology, because in a way, that's the easy bit. That's the bit outside of us that we can play with. The tough bit is the bit inside of us. And if we don't deal with that, then the potential for the technology to, to wreak uh, mayhem in our yeah, planet also, is... Huge. I was thinking more in the optimistic scenario, in the, in the scenario that we do manage ourselves sure. and, and you know, get hold and everything. And we have like both things going on, like... Well, I think uh, for me, it'll be a sense of what is a, you know, post cognitive. So it's not, you talked a lot about thinking, but it's not going to be so much about thinking. Yeah. It's going to be more an, in, um, a kind of an intuitive felt experience of reality where the mind is in service. So the mind doesn't lead it's still there and still very useful, but it's not what leads. It's our felt intuitive sense of who we are and moving as a whole as the earth that's what will lead as the cosmos you know and then when we need the mind to think stuff up well you know sure but we'll be but we'll when we're plugged in and whole we'll we won't need to think up solutions we'll know because the field will inform us and we'll feel the resonance with others and so it'll be a lot less effort actually <laughs> than it is now <laughs> So, you know, if it's, if it's a big effort, it means we're probably down, going down the wrong track. Yeah. <laughs> a great question. Great question. Yeah. yeah, excellent. So we have got Raquel and uh, we have Ian. Uh, hopefully we have time for both. We've got about five minutes left. Okay, I think Raquel's saying move on. So Ian, I'm intrigued. What's your question? <laughs> Peter, it's been a while. Hey, Ian. Good Thanks. to see you. Hey. <laughs> Uh, Peter, my, my question is about uh, about science and I'm uh, attempting to go back to uh, what is the force that powers this whole evolution? There is a theory coming out of MIT, a graduate school student right now, of why do we exist? And the answer is extremely mundane. It's because of the second law of thermodynamics, where everything in a closed system moves from a state of order to disorder. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. There's a second posit of science, which is equally as boring, that human consciousness only evolves because uh, we have our faculties only because it was a better way of finding food. <laughs> I'm wondering, these, these two really basic uh, views of science, one in physics and particularly one in chemistry, I just wanted to hear your, your view on that, on how much that actually causes the life to evolve. <laughs> yeah, good one. <clears throat> This is like in the thesis, you'll see how um, I describe it, the first, how, how we can actually integrate the relativity theory and quantum theory, where um, that second law of thermodynamics around entropy, um, it's actually a slight, slight miss, I would say, formation of how things are, because they don't fall apart, they differentiate. Right. So um, you would say that there are, if it's all information, that's in formation and that is triggered through consciousness, then one at one level, you've got information expressed as energy matter. 
right, which is quantum physics. And you've got information expressed in space time, which is relativity theory. And when you connect both of those up, you've got information expressed as energy matter in space time and space time. So there is, um, if you, I could, this could go, this could take a while, but you look, in, look into some of Jude Caravan's work or read the kind of section in the thesis. But um, <clears throat> that's the way to, to transcend the polarity between relativity and quantum theory is to think of it all as information expressed as energy matter and and it does and, the, and the, you don't it, the laws still hold up so the laws of thermodynamics still hold up at one level of reality right but at the quantum level of reality they don't so that's where we get beyond space time and information is expressed as energy matter there and in space time and relativity um, in terms of um, why we developed consciousness so we could get more food well you know certainly at some point in our evolution <laughs> um, right now it is probably also so we can still have food to eat but then uh, right with the different kind of life conditions so uh, obviously there's some you know if bears disappears then the whole pyramid collapses and the whole thing disappears so no bears no anything else um, but you know that's Maslow and everything else as well so fundamentally uh, yeah but it, will there be a way you know, I don't know, you have this, these breatharian kind of people who think they can survive on, on breath and energy. I don't know, I've, maybe. Maybe, can turquoise actually, you know, can you connect to a field of information? Is food just information? It may just, uh, if we went that route, it might just take us out of the material world because, you know, well, why are we here otherwise? But you'd put me on to, led, sorry, uh, going slightly off topic here, uh, Ian, but... Um, related to something someone was saying before that a somebody showed me a model of i think it was twenty five thousand year cycles of the planet and you saw humanity you had fossils for people uh, and for a certain period then you had a whole twenty five thousand year cycle with no human fossils and then they came back again so what happened in that 25,000 year period, you know, did we kind of dematerialize? Do we go through cycles of materializing and then dematerializing and then rematerializing? And so I don't know, who knows? <laughs> yeah. But uh, anyway, that's the kind of another big question. But thanks, Ian. Good to see you. <laughs> Great. Thank uh, you, Peter. We just have one minute left. So I, I really did want to hear from Danielle as well, but I am, as a facilitator, I have to be really strict on these timings. I just say, Chris, very quickly, somebody of... asked about the book. There isn't a I book was going to mention that, that. yeah. But uh, it, I am working on it. You can look, you can find it at volutiontheory.net, the original thesis. I have made a slightly more approachable version of it. And um, there's going to be the, a philosophical book that will basically lay out volution theory. And then there's going to be a kind of more, what would you say, more popular kind of called the pain and the promise that basically goes into that whole split uh, thing and what the promise is, uh, but what the pain is that we have to deal with first. Um, so those are in the pipeline. Yeah, the existing two are evolutionary leadership, which you might think of as a kind of yellow uh, thesis around how we need to organize and lead ourselves and why work. It's actually a piece I wrote a while, a while ago, but seems to be relevant now is about how we evolve our macro and local economics to be able to um, honor people and planet, basically. Yeah. So that's nothing to do with evolution theory, <laughs> <laughs> but could be really useful. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I've had so many great comments coming in on the chat box here. Everyone seems to have thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank, thank you. you. Good luck. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Everyone. Bye. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Compris.